you are one of my hero. I even have your book. Okay, yeah. so that's so, very old. I've that, done two versions of that since then. <laughs> does it mean that everything that you wrote in this book is it still relevant? Yeah, it world? is. It is. It is. I've updated it twice. <laughs> Set me the new version, Richard. So, if you're saying, Richard, you're my hero from all those years ago. Yeah. And I haven't kept up with anything you've been doing. I read one book and no, that was it's it. A, it's all right. Olivier will, you know, he'll find it eventually. You'll find the third edition. And I'll be on the fifth. And, you know, it'll be all right. <laughs> Welcome to the Masks Off podcast, Leadership Strategies, No Disguises. I'm Razwana Wahid, and together with my co-host Olivier Larvar, we talk to the smartest people in the world of leadership, change, and psychology to give leaders real strategies to bring human back to the workplace. If you would like to support our show, please subscribe to our channel, like us, or share this episode on your social media. In today's episode, author and consultant Richard Barrett join us to talk about where organizational culture comes from and how we can measure it, knowing it's pretty intangible. I was very, very intrigued about one thing, uh, about your concept, about seeing the organization as a living entity. In our mind, organization, just like it's kind of a machine, you know, we go there, input, output, processes, plug in, plug out, leave, and then you leave. Here, from your books and your theory, it's all about looking at the organization as a living entity. Many people talk about an organization being a living entity. That can be confusing. I'm talking about it as a living human entity because <laughs> they talk about organization as a living entity, but it's a living human. It's, you know, it's like every group, human group structure uh, has a culture. The culture of a human group structure, like an organization, is a reflection of the consciousness of the leaders. What do I mean by that? The values and behaviors of the leaders. And so the values and behaviors of the leaders actually set the tone and the culture for the whole organization. If the culture is toxic, well, you know, look at yourself, Mr. Leader, because that's a reflection of who you are. Organizations don't transform, people do. And organizational transformation begins with the transformation of the leaders, period. Wow, done. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that a leader of a team, because ultimately, you know, when people change, teams change, organizations change. A leader of a team notices there's a lack of trust in their team. Either information isn't being shared or it's being hidden or people are being stabbed in the back. So with, with the theory of that is a reflection of the leader, how can a leader then change their behavior in order to create more trust in that team? Measurement matters. So you need to be able to, what I've spent the last 20 years doing is figuring out how to measure the intangible. And what do I mean by that? Well, how do you measure uh, behavior? How do you measure values? How do you measure culture? Two things to say about your question. One is within an organization, you can have an overall culture, but within a particular team, it can be more toxic or it can be less toxic. In fact, it could be fantastic within one team. It's a reflection of the leader of the team in a organization which is somewhat toxic it has bureaucracy internal competition blame you may be able to find an island of, of sanity in a particular team now that leader can create within his team a different condition providing he protects the employees from that overall culture you mentioned the word trust one of the most downloaded blogs that I've ever written is called The Trust Matrix. And in that, it, there's an exercise that a leader can do, whether it's the leader of the organization working with his team or whether it's a, a supervisor working with his team. There's an exercise that you can do which gets to the very heart of what is the problem with regard to trust. It's called the trust matrix. I encourage people to go to my blog, go to richardbarrett.net, and there you'll find my blogs and my videos and my articles and everything else and my podcasts. And um, if you go to the blog, you'll find a reference to the trust matrix. It's a fantastic two-hour exercise that gets to the very heart of what's not working and what do we need to do as a group in order to improve. You know, trust is something you have to work on and you need feedback in order to do it.
You talked about culture, values, you know, missions. Why is it important, really? You know, because you, you look at oh, all the you, you look at all the startups right now. They're just in this go 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 mode. Still in big organization, yeah, they say we have culture, we have mission values, but still they don't really believe in that. Every focus right now, it's it's all about technology, as you know, and everyone wants to transform. So. Tell us, why is that important? Values are the energetic drivers of our aspirations and intentions. Now, let's say you're an organization, Olivier. Okay, I'm sorry to pick on you, but you happen to be here on the podcast. Okay, so are you successful in your life? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. But how can you be more successful? Well, I could have a sense of purpose. Oh, yeah, okay, so I could. Do you have a sense of purpose? I have. Okay, and and so... And do you have some values that you hang on to when things get tough and you think, oh, bugger, what can I do? Uh, you know, my beliefs are not working here. What do you turn to? You turn to your values. You see, values uh, are a higher form of expression of what lies deep within our souls, basically. Whereas beliefs, beliefs actually separate people. Values unite people. If we were yeah. to sit down and talk about our values, we'd find that we would be very similar and would, something amazing would happen. We'd feel connected. When you talk about what's important to you, you open yourself up. Values are really fundamentally important for creating something I call internal cohesion, which is basically it's higher actually than teamwork. It's like, how do we all get along together? And how do we have a purpose which we can all unite behind and a sense of mission and values which lead to behaviors that we can all agree on? What happens is as soon as you do that, you unleash the discretionary energy of your people. What does that mean? Everybody has a certain amount of energy which they have each day and they can decide, hmm, I'm going to give all my energy to my work or I'm going to just to mess about at work, play around on the uh, web and go home and put all my energy into my sports activities. So everybody has discretionary energy. When you captivate people and you get them aligned with the vision and mission and they feel a sense of purpose and they're making a difference, the amount of discretionary energy you get captured into the organization increases fantastically. That's the secret of engagement. We are, we are, Absolutely. All the organizations are just like chasing for engagement, engagement. Still, they are not addressing that because I believe this is what you just said. You, you said it's intangible. You cannot, you cannot yeah. see it. You cannot feel it. And like, if I cannot see it, if I cannot feel it, well, what can I do really? Well, I tell you what you can do. You can come to us and we'll measure it for you because that's what we measure. <laughs> Okay, can you put the price tag, you know, how much are your services <laughs> at the same time? Sorry, I shouldn't have said that, sorry. <laughs> can you just get, like, the practical, like, tips, you know, like, for, for organization? If they want, like, to say, okay, fine, so values is important. If I want to have engagement, I need to, to find the core values of my organization. So how, how can they do that? If you can measure something, you can manage it. So the first thing you have to be able to do is measure the culture by mapping the values. And that's what we do at the Barrett Values Center. Now, one of the things that comes out of our analysis very quickly is something called cultural entropy. What the hell is that? That's the degree of dysfunction in the system due to fear-based behaviors of the leaders. So you can tell as soon as you work into an organization that there's a lot of cultural entropy, there's no cohesion. Everybody's feeling glum or sad. Uh, there's a lot of blame going on. And of course, productivity is low and engagement is low. You go into an organization where, with a low level of cultural entropy and you find a high sense of engagement. We mapped the correlation between entropy and employee engagement in 163 uh, organizations in Australia, and we found a very, very strong relationship between the level of engagement and the level of cultural entropy. So high entropy, high dysfunction, low engagement, low entropy, high engagement. So actually, you don't even need to measure engagement. If you measure entropy, you've got it right there. Can you talk us through a little bit how you measure it? I think it would be interesting for our audience to hear a little bit more about that. And I know it will be a sales pitch, Richard. Oh, absolutely not. That is a fascinating scientific question you just asked. <laughs> no, but I mean, people will want to know about this because it's like unique. There's nothing else like it on the planet. 
in all seriousness, I think they will want to hear about it because it's how do you how do you measure something that is seemingly okay. intangible? Well, yeah. basically, here's the fascinating part. We only ask three questions, and you're like, oh my god, what are the questions? <laughs> I'm, you've got me at the edge of my seat now. Exactly, I'm the right. edge of my yeah, seat. Like, we only yeah. ask three questions, <laughs> and and it provides you with a complete analysis, like a laser. It points into exactly what's working and not working in which business unit, in which location, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the three questions we ask are these: Which of the following values behaviors most represent who you are? as an individual. And they pick from a list of about 80 words. Every value they pick belongs to what I call one of the seven levels of consciousness, which the levels of consciousness are as an extension of Maslow's hierarchy, basically, where I shift in his hierarchy from co needs to consciousness. The second question is, which of the following value behaviors most represent how your organization operates? So first question is about my personal values. Then how does my organization operate? You have a slightly different list, which is customized for your organization. And you can pick positive values like creativity, trust, openness. And you can pick limiting values like bureaucracy, internal competition, etc. And then the third question is, which of the following value behaviors most represents for you a high performing organization? You've got personal values, current culture, desired culture. And we plot the top 10 personal, current, desired for each business unit, for the whole organization. And in all of the gaps, we find the issue. If there's a lot of agreement, so we've got five matching values between personal and current and six matching between current and desire. We know we are a high performing organization with a very low level of cultural entropy. How do we measure entropy? Well, you know, I said you can pick values from a list. You pick 10 lists from a list of about 80 or 90, and there are positive words and potentially limiting words. So if you add up the percentage of votes in a business unit or for the whole organization, which are those limiting words, you are the percentage of votes for those limiting words is your level of cultural entropy. Just to show you how powerful that is, in 2008, I think it was in August, we actually mapped the values of Iceland. Now, Iceland is the most democratic country on the planet. And I was absolutely shocked when I saw levels of cultural entropy in Iceland at 52%. In a high-performing organization, it's usually around 10%. I went to Iceland in September of 2008, and I said, in, on television and, and various speeches, I said, look, you know, that you've got many problems about your culture in Iceland. And if you were an organization, you'd be going bankrupt about now because there'd be so much energy going into unproductive activities. Two weeks later, Iceland went bankrupt. Okay. So you were basically the messiah. That's the power of you. <laughs> How do you convince these leaders, like leaders that can, can listen to us, who are still hard driven by results? and objectives and ROIs and money. Try to talk about them, about consciousness, first of all. So I'm sure that the first thing that you must have is just like this weird look to say, really, do I really need that, you know, in my organization? If I'm talking to those people, I don't talk about consciousness, I'll talk about values, or right. I'll talk about results, yeah. even. So obviously, good results are important to you. Um, how would you like to improve your results by actually doing very little, just changing your behaviors? So now I'm, they start to get interested and I say, well, you know, um, because the issue here isn't, when you focus on the outputs, on the outcomes, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You should be focusing on the inputs. In other words, focusing on your employees and what should you be focusing on? Well, what are the needs of your employees? Because when employees get their needs met, then they come to work full of joy and happiness and they can't wait for Monday morning in order to get to work because they get their needs met. Oh, okay, so what you're saying is that if I focus on, on my employees, on the inputs, then my outputs will improve. Absolutely, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm saying also that employees in different work categories at different psychological levels of uh, development will have different needs. What do you mean by that? Well, if you're in your 20s and 30s, you're actually at the, what's called the individuating stage of psychological development. You, you're looking for freedom and you're looking for possibilities and you're ambitious and you want to be able to find out what you're good at and what you're not so good at. If you're in your 40s, well, you've, you found out that now you're looking for meaning and purpose in your work. You want to have meaning and purpose. You want, I want to feel good about what I'm doing. And then in the 50s, it's like, 
Aha, okay, now I found meaning and purpose through my work. What do I really want? I want to make a difference. I want to actually do something that makes a difference. And then in my 60s, wow, I'm having so much fun with my meaning and purpose and making a difference. I just want to be, I just want to serve the planet. I want to serve humanity because it's so much fun. I get so much joy out of it. Because when I listen to you, fine, it seems that you found that, you know, yourself. I have. I think that you're a rare species. Because uh, finding meaning, purpose, making a difference to the world, I think even, I don't even think it's a question of age. I think every level, I, I can talk to people in their 20s, 30s, they want purpose, they want meanings, they want to, to, be, to, to feel good about themselves and to, they want to make a difference to the world. Yes, the interesting thing is, I mean, I've studied this in great detail, mm -hmm. that the, as you move up in the different ages, the, the way that you get to meaning and purpose changes. So in your 20s and early 30s, you get to finding meaning and purpose through ambition. And in your 40s, you get to it through the feeling of alignment, of a sense of internal cohesion. I mean, you know, if you allow me, I might even use the word soul. There's an alignment between your ego and your soul. You're like, oh, wow, I'm As we say in England, I'm cooking on gas. I don't know <laughs> what that translates to in French. But it means you're really alive and you're, and you're enjoying every minute of what you do. Okay, so let me ask you two a question. Do you enjoy what you do? Absolutely. Now, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely love it. Why? Just like what you said, I'm aligned with what I do. My activity is aligned with my values about serving others Uh, supporting others and, and making a difference. If I take you from your position where you are right now and I put you in there in charge of a 100,000 person organization, it's the same idea. How do you create an organization where people can find meaning and purpose? Because if you can do that, you can create a high performing company. Can you give like practical advice for leaders? What can they do tomorrow if they want like to follow this, this model? I, I, I've written several books, but one of them is uh, the new leadership. <laughs> really? really? <laughs> buy, buy the books. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, no. The new leadership paradigm. In there, it, t it tell you exactly. Is that the first thing you have to do as a supervisor, manager, or leader, is learn to lead yourself. In other words, you learn to be in alignment with who you are. If you can't lead yourself, you cannot lead a team. Now, the second job is how do I lead a team? Because if I can now find meaning and purpose by leading myself, I can help my team find meaning and purpose in the way that I lead them. And thirdly, if you can lead a team, then you can lead an organization. But you have, it all begins with leading yourself, and leading yourself begins with feedback from the people you work with. And be open to receive this feedback as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and willing to do something about it, whatever it is. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Once again, if you would like to support our show, please subscribe to our channel, like us or share this episode on your social media. Merci. 